Eric was just um, a wonderful, um, delightful, good human being. You know, from the time he was little, he was very compassionate and understanding, wise beyond his years. He was more quiet. You know, he didn't um, need to be the center of attention. He uh, um, was very confident. He knew of his own abilities, although he, didn't, he wouldn't make other people know that. He didn't believe in a lot of limits, you know. He always thought, you know, if you wanted to do something, you could do it. He had a couple of close friends, and he had a lot of acquaintances. And he had a very close relationship with his girlfriend, Holly. They had been together for a couple of years, and he had kind of found his true love. I met Eric in freshman year. We had um, geography together. The way he was with me and the way he was with other people, you couldn't help but not realize how kind he was. We sort of had this understanding that we didn't know what was going to happen because, you know, we were 19 years old. Um, but we both knew we wanted to end up together. Eric had just finished his first year at Berkeley, majoring in molecular biology. And, you know, we had been spending time together as a family since Eric had, had come home for the summer. And he just seemed energized. We got up and we decided we'd take a hike as a family. Eric and I and Eileen went for hike, a hike out in the Orchid Hills for a couple hours. And Eileen was thinking about buying a new car. So after the hiking, we went and uh, she went shopping for, for a car. And, we had a good afternoon together, and after we looked at a car, we came home and had pizza. Eight, the three of us ate together. He and I talked about, well, let's go for a bike ride together tomorrow, and we were going to ride out to Guadalupe in the morning before the winds got going, and, and have breakfast, and then ride back. And at the last minute, uh, he decided he would go for a ride alone. We talked on Skype a little bit. He was telling me he was going for a bike ride before he was gonna come to my house. So he said he'd be done in an hour and then he'd call me. And then we said goodbye. A half hour later, someone said they found his cell phone. They said, the battery's dying, we're going to take it to the police station. You know, normally I don't worry about my kids when they're gone because they're very capable. But we got in the car and we went to go look for him. If he had dropped his phone somewhere, then, you know, he wouldn't be able to call if, you know, if he'd had an accident or a, a flat tire or something. We somehow heard, because Holly was out looking for Eric as well, that there had been an accident on Telephone Road. So we went there and it was all kinds of police cars parked around and, you know, lights were still uh, flashing. I called Eileen, but she said she was going to call back. Um, I called again and she didn't answer. And then you know, I was just trying to be patient, which was impossible. As we drove up, they, um, we told them who we were, and they said, yes, it was a cyclist, and, and yes, um, that there was a fatality. So they brought out the bike bag he had underneath his bike, and I had given him $20 to kind of keep in his bike bag in case, you know, he broke down somewhere and he needed a cab. And, the bike bag had $20, and so we, we knew that that was Eric. I called her again, and she said that the, uh, the person on the scene said that they took him straight to um, the sheriff's department. And um, I asked what that meant, and she said uh, that that they don't take you to the hospital when you die. And we didn't see him for three or four days after that when he was cold. It was horrible to see him like that. 
And now all the magic's gone from our lives. I used to get up and I loved every day, even if there were challenges. And now it's just a labor to live. It's a sense of disbelief. It's so hard to comprehend that that knowing that he was gone, he was killed. Initially, it was presented that it was an unavoidable accident that, you know, couldn't avoid him and, and hit him, and, and he died. But subsequently, we found that it, it wasn't uh, the circumstances whatsoever, that it was a, a clear day. There was no fog. There was no obstructions. Eric was riding on the uh, right side of the road where he sh should have been. You know, there's not a bike lane there. It's not a real wide road, but there's enough room for a, a car to pass a bicyclist without hitting him. There was a little bit of a hill, and he had just come over the top of the hill. On weekdays, there can be a little traffic there because there's a, 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 a packing plant there, but on weekends, there's not much traffic there at all. And this driver lives on that road, so she knows that there's always cyclists there. It's a county-designated bicycle route. She was going riding to the right side of her lane, because if she'd been right in the middle of the lane, she wouldn't have hit him, even if she didn't see him. So she was, had drifted to the right side of the road, and she hit him with the right side of her car, head on. She didn't see him until she impacted him, so she didn't have a chance to swerve. She didn't have a chance to put on the brake. You know, she might have taken her foot off the accelerator, but we don't know that. And so when she hit him, she threw his body 140 feet in the air, knocked his helmet off, uh, but it wouldn't have mattered because his neck was broken. And then uh, after she hit him, she didn't call 911. You know, she didn't go and attend to him and hold him, you know, so that in his last breath he could see a human face, you know, and she didn't comfort him. He died alone, you know, by himself. Some passerby came by shortly afterwards, and then they called 911 when they got there. So just like she was preoccupied with whatever her thoughts were before she killed him, she remained preoccupied. I mean, the law requires that if you injure someone, you call 911, that you try to offer assistance. But she had probably flipped out. The road was unobstructed. She had at least 550 feet of clear, unobstructed vision. And when you account for the fact that he was moving away from her when he was cycling, when we've gone and re-enacted the accident, he was visible for the entire 45 seconds she was on Telephone Road. There was never a moment where she wouldn't have seen him if she'd been looking at the road. So clearly this was a case of driver distraction. Although she denied any distraction, uh, it was found that there was texting activity both incoming and outgoing. That certainly explains her distraction. Could she have been texting and using her iPod or doing something else? I don't know. All I know is that she was a very distracted driver traveling 60 miles an hour for tens of seconds not looking at the road. 